Hello, everyone. My name is Ridvan Bariurkos. Uh, today, together with my colleague uh, Marek Budish, uh, we are welcoming a uh, very interesting guest, Pavel uh, Luzin from uh, James Jamestown Foundation. He is a senior fellow at this uh, analytical center. And uh, Pavel Luzin, he is quite interesting writer, thinker regarding the uh, Russian defense policy and regarding particularly uh, currently uh, when we having Russo-Ukrainian Russo war, his uh, writings very important in order to understand what's going on in Russia. Welcome to the strategy in the future, Pavel. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, or good morning, depends on where you are right now. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Pavel. So my first question, it would be more like a general, more common, uh, because recently uh, in the West, it's one of the most popular issue, it is mobilization. And you are covering this topic quite often. How you would describe what's going on in Russia regarding mobilization and how successful it is? What kind of uh, what is danger is coming from this process to to the West, uh, to Ukraine, and uh, particularly, I would say, like a, uh, for es further escalation of this war. And and so, to be more and to be more precise. Why Mr. Sobyanin and um, after him Putin decide to stop the mobilization in the middle of the um, of the process, as um, uh, as I understand the situation. Oh, um, so uh, your questions uh, are complicated, so we 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 have to divide them in several parts. First of all, uh, the mobilization. Uh, is an act of escalation itself. Uh, so when you proclaim mobilization, uh, so that means uh, you try to escalate the situation. Uh, the purpose of this escalation uh, is, um, is motivating the West, Kyiv as well, uh, for negotiations, for ceasefire agreement, uh, for some peace talks, maybe, uh, but the main uh, point here uh, is uh, giving Russia a kind of break within this war. I mean, uh, a kind of um, uh, to, uh, giving Russia a time. I, I, I get, yeah, giving Russia time to restore uh, some of its uh, military capacity. Uh, that's what uh, the Kremlin wants. Uh, secondly, the mobilization is aimed to restore some manpower, not in terms of quality of this manpower, but in terms of just quantity of this part. Uh, because Pavel, uh, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt so, you because yeah. Yeah. what is important, I think, to 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 to, to inform our uh, our viewers is they decided to 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 rebuild the the uh, the manpower for the defense or for the offense, because there are few uh, few points of view. Uh, is it yes. is it this defensive move or offensive? Uh, first of all, uh, it is a defensive move because uh, they want to keep the currently occupied Ukrainian territories. They want to uh, even not to stop but to slow uh, the Ukrainian counteroffense. So the first. Uh, the, the first thing of this mobilization, but uh, the mobilization officially does not have any limits or any, I don't know, deadline. That means um, the mobilization uh, may be a kind of uh, endless process, 
And uh, in future, for instance, next year or in a couple of years, depends on uh, whether or not the Kremlin will be able to get uh, some ceasefire agreement uh, or not. Uh, in future, this mobilized uh, people uh, are aimed to be used in uh, offensive operations because uh, the Kremlin uh, does not give up its original strategic purpose of this war. And the strategic purpose of this war is a complete elimination of the Ukrainian statehood, of the Ukrainian culture, and of the Ukrainian nation. So as that means currently the mobilization is aimed uh, for defense, but um, future waves of mobilization uh, will be aimed uh, for offense. In case of uh, Russia will be able to continue this war, in case of uh, Ukraine uh, will not be able to defeat Russia on, on the battlefield um, anytime soon. Yes, but you know, comparing the, the, the manpower of Ukrainian forces um, uh, with uh, um, uh, capacity to mobilize the, the additional uh, forces in Russia. Uh, it will be extremely difficult, in the, in our opinion, uh, to receive the necessary numerical advantage on the Rus Russia side to be able to to uh, to be uh, to make uh, uh, offensive steps because. At least you have three to one. Um, uh, you you should you should have the three to one advantage that it's uh, it, in practice uh, for the foreseeable future. It's impossible just now. In my uh, exactly, opinion. you're uh, totally right. But um, what's the, the calculations uh, of of Kremlin? Because uh, Kremlin. Uh, combines the mobilization with uh, terror attacks against uh, Ukraine population. Uh, Kremlin uh, believes that uh, the global situation uh, may change in uh, coming uh, several months. For instance, uh, for instance, um, the elections uh, in the U.S. Co co Congress may change the situation. In, uh, in the Kremlin's uh, in the Kremlin's heads, uh, they believe um, in this option. Uh, I don't know. The economic crisis in Europe may change the situation. Some uh, military crisis uh, on the Middle East or um, on the Pacific uh, region may change the situation. So the Kremlin uh, currently is very opportunistic. And uh, of course, now they are not able to restore its manpower, even in quantity, uh, in terms of quantity, just uh, some, uh, some compensation of uh, losses of previous eight months. But uh, we don't know uh, the rationality of, of the Kremlin because, uh, uh, because when they started, this war they believed in in in, in completely uh, irrational things they believed that they will be able um, to defeat ukraine in three days or in five days that doesn't matter they believed that their armed forces uh, um, they are so strong and so uh, so powerful uh, and uh, we also know that there are um, kind of disruption of communication channels within the Russian uh, uh, governance. I mean, uh, when three years ago, uh, the Russian, at that time, vice uh, premier um, minister, vice prime minister, um, Yuri Borisov, was forced to use RBC newspaper to send a message to the Kremlin about the... Uh, pure, um, about very poor statement uh, uh, of the Russian defense industry. That means that even the vice prime minister does not have a direct channel, um, communication channel with, uh, with the Kremlin. So 
uh, what uh, what is the information that the, that the Kremlin uh, has right now? We don't know this. We see the deep um, crisis of governance in Russia. Uh, so, uh, of course, objectively speaking, Russia will never be able to conduct uh, a successful offensive operation uh, against Ukraine because uh, Russia lost its best forces. Russia lost uh, a lot of uh, uh, arms, a lot of other equipment, and Russia will not be able to reproduce this and, and, uh, and uh, will not be able never because the current sanctions uh, make this restoration of uh, military power just impossible. So uh, uh, the Russian defense industry uh, will um, will degrade more and more. Pavel, uh, so, and uh, yes, yes, Pavel, uh, and and. Could you could you describe briefly the capabilities of uh, Russian uh, uh, industrial sector working for the army? Because we've read uh, your very interesting articles about uh, uh, published uh, last few months in Insider and in other uh, in, in in other media about this uh, limited capabilities. But nobody knows how much, for example, tanks and transporters the the industry in Russia yearly is able to to produce. The same story with turrets. The same story with ammunition depots, uh, engines. Uh, for 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 tanks and for for airplanes. So, could you briefly describe this, um, uh, or 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 the, the the show us the picture how 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 capable is uh, Russian industrial sector? So, the Russian defense industry is is not uh, too much capable, because um, in previous uh, already. 12 years, okay, uh, from 2009 2010, um, the, it, it was the uh, highest capacity of the Russian defense sector, the last uh, 10, 12 years, um, before, be, uh, before the large scale uh, attack against Ukraine, I mean, before February 24. And uh, in, in terms of uh, combat helicopters, for instance, uh, only 25 to 30 units and uh, the Russian, uh, the Russian uh, factories uh, were able to produce. Even with using Ukrainian helicopter engines, uh, in terms of air, uh, combat aircrafts, uh Russia was able to produce uh, average amount of uh, 30 35 units annually uh combat aircraft i mean su uh, 30 sm sm2 and other modifications uh su 34 su 35 uh, so uh, from 30 to 35 um, units uh, and uh, of course Russia uh, has a, a significant uh, storage head a significant storage of uh, su-24 and uh, su-25 combat aircraft but uh, in my opinion this war is the last war for these types of aircraft because um, after this war uh, those planes uh, which will survive, uh, they will need a repairment. Uh, and uh, the repairment uh, currently does not have any sense for these types of aircraft. Uh, in terms of um, tanks and armored vehicles, it's uh, it's not so easy to count, but uh, what uh, I saw in previous several years, no more than 100, uh, 150, 160 uh, modernized battle tanks annually. I mean uh, T-72 uh, uh, and uh, T-80 types, and no more than uh, 
10 to 12 uh, new uh, tanks, I mean T-90. They are not new uh, in terms of development, but they are new in terms of manufacturing. I mean, uh, T-72, T-80, these tanks uh, were produced in 1970s, 1980s, and now they are modernized. And towards uh, armored vehicles, um, so no more than uh, 400 uh, new, uh, newly manufactured and modernized uh, armored vehicles um, annually. Uh, Pavel, so Pavel? Uh, modernize it. Yeah, yes, uh, modernize it. Uh, armored vehicles uh, means that uh, they were taken from either military units or storage bases and um, were modernized uh, on the factory. They were so, added with uh, I don't know communication system and so mm -hmm. on, new engine. Uh, Pavel, the, so I think it's the most important for Ukrainians, particularly the question regarding the missiles, so the rockets, the caliber, and kinjals. <laughs> so uh, it's I remember very good how the, the political commentators, military experts, already in March and April were saying that Russia exhausted own capa capability to build or produce uh, the missiles like caliber or kinjal. So what about how you would command this? Because uh, Russia is still attacking and using calibers. Uh, Kinjal, Kinjals are still a uh, very operative element of Russian, uh, la la let's say, uh, air warfare in Ukraine. Mm, I'm not sure about Kinjal mm -hmm. because uh, there were no too many evidences of using this type of uh, uh -huh. okay. uh, mi uh, missile and uh, we didn't see uh, the remaining parts of this missile missiles mm -hmm. i mean uh, uh, for me kinjal missile remains to be something myth mythical mm -hmm. uh, weapon because uh, it appeared in in in, in 2018 uh, it appeared uh, from nowhere. Uh, there, uh, there was no, uh, I don't know, uh, R&D program. There was no uh, significant uh, uh, supply chains uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so for, for, for me, uh, Kinjal uh, still is either uh, using of H-22 uh, or H-32 missile, not on uh, 22 uh, M3 bomber, but uh, on uh, MiG-31 fighter, because uh, there are uh, huge technical problems with two 22 M3 bombers with their engines. I mean. Uh, and uh, or okay, some experts say uh, say that uh, it, it is an Iskander missile uh, just using from from the fighter, no, not from the ground. I'm not sure that uh, the ground-based ballistic missile uh, may be easily used uh, on fight. Because the different physics uh, of uh, uh, of flight, uh, and uh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it's a kind of um, you know reproducing uh, of 1960 uh, 60s ex experience when, uh, for instance, uh, the Americans uh, have a Skybolt program uh, where they developed uh, aeroballistic missile, but the range of, of, of that missile uh, was not so huge, just a couple of hundreds of miles. So it's uh, 300, 400 kilometers. Uh, and uh, the, the, there is no much sense. But how of, about of, caliber, of, caliber? Of using it. Caliber, yes. Um, caliber definitely exists in several types of this missile. 
I mean, sea-based uh, missiles, ground-based missiles, uh, 9M729, uh, and uh, air-based uh, missile uh, Ha-101. It is also a caliber type uh, missile. Uh, okay, and also Russia uh, uses uh, anti-ship missile Onyx uh, or P-800. It's a supersonic uh, ramjet uh, missile, and uh, anti-ship missile the, the, that is used against uh, ground targets in Ukraine. So the Russian manufacturing uh, capacity um, is limited here because... Uh, each type of uh, caliber uh, missile R Russia is able to produce in amount of uh, 50, no more than 50 uh, missiles annually. Per month? Towards per Iskander, uh, per, uh, per year, annually, uh -huh. every year, not, not in months. In months, sure. it, it's impossible to, to produce such amount every year. Uh, Iskander uh, mis uh, ballistic missile can be produced in amount also no more than 50 missiles annually. Uh, sometimes, um, some years, uh, uh, it looked like uh, the amount was limited uh, by 30 to 40 units, but uh, let it be 50, no more than 50 units annually. And towards uh, uh, ha 32 or KH, KH uh, 32 missile, it's a um, replacement of KH 22 uh, missile. Uh, the amount is no, uh, is no more than 20 units every year, no more than 20. It's a very sophisticated uh, missile, uh, liquid fueled missile, uh, and uh, uh, sophisticated engine and, and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, the total amount uh, and Onyx, Onyx of course, Onyx uh, no more than 55 um, missiles annually. Uh, so uh, we may uh, say that uh, the total amount of, of uh, the missiles that Russia can produce every year is no more than 225 missiles, 225. Because um, towards um, caliber uh, missiles, there are different types, uh, but um, there are just uh, two type of engines uh, for this um, missile. So one engine uh, gives an opportunity to uh, give the range of up to 2,500 kilometers. Uh, so this uh, engine is used on KH-101 uh, missile and on Caliber NK missile. It's a sea-based long-range uh, cruise missile, uh, firstly used in 2015 um, in Syria. Uh, and the second engine uh, gives, uh, gives a range uh, up to 1,000 kilometers, uh, and uh, it is used on normal, typical sea-based uh, caliber missile and on uh, ground-based caliber missile, I mean uh, 9M729 uh, cruise missile, or Iskander K uh, system. So, uh, so, 50 um, units of caliber long range missiles, uh, 50 units of uh, caliber uh, up to 1000 kilometers missile uh, with a range of uh, 1000 kilometers, uh, 55 units of Onyx supersonic anti ship missiles, uh, up to 50 units of uh, Iskander ballistic missiles and uh, up to 20 units of uh, KH-32 uh, missile. Oh, so uh, th that's all, that's all. Uh, oh, oh, 
only this uh, missiles uh, give Russia an opportunity to strike um, on a range more than 300 kilometers. Of course, Russia also has uh, a shorter range missiles. I mean, KH 59. Uh, and uh, KH-35. Towards these types of missiles, uh, I cannot estimate the manufacturing capacity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this capacity cannot be huge. It cannot be, you know, hundreds of missiles every year. It cannot be this. Uh, so uh, Russia is losing. Uh, its uh, missile uh, capacity, of course, uh, the Russian uh, the Russian uh, storage of uh, KH-555, it's a Soviet-era uh, cruise missile, uh, air-based, it's a predecessor of uh, KH-101. Uh, these uh, missiles uh, were manufactured, uh, were manufactured uh, in Kharkiv, in Ukraine in 1980s. So uh, they are not manufactured anymore. And uh, Russia fired the most of them, uh, or almost all of them. Russia also fired uh, a significant amount of KH-22 uh, missiles. And uh, they are very sensitive. These missiles are very sensitive to storage conditions. Uh, and uh, even if uh, Russia still has uh, some amount of them, uh, the most of, of these missiles cannot be used. Just uh, just several of them uh, may be used because of uh, sensitivity for storage conditions and because of liquid fuel uh, and and so on and so on. So. Um, the Russian storages of uh, missiles that Russia produced in previous 10, 12, 12 years and uh, towards Iskander ballistic missiles, uh, Russia produced them in previous 15 years. Uh, the most of the storage uh, is exhausted yeah. right now. Russia still has a capacity to produce these missiles, still has a capacity. Because of storage of components, storage of electronics, and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, I presume that this year Russia will be able to keep the annual uh, manufacturing capacity. And maybe next year Russia still will be able to keep the manufacturing capacity. But uh, after 2023, uh, I am sure that the number of um, manufactured missiles uh, will decline and will decline significantly year by year. So you and say... At the end... But the capacity at yeah. the level of 250 more or less items yearly. 225. No, yeah, 225. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But let me, okay. let me ask... Uh, one more question, because more or less the same picture is with traditional artillery munition. A few months ago, uh, I've read your article where you predicted that before the end of the year, the, the, the Russians will have a, a tremendous problems with uh, with munitions. And then even will uh, be the rationing of, um, uh, of consumption. Uh, and if we s compare the intensity of fire uh, in, uh, in May or in June with, uh, with today uh, situation, that the, the intensity is much lower. Is it uh, this uh, phase of the war you predicted that they will uh, exhaust their, their um, uh, traditional artillery munition uh, capacities? Uh, it seems so. They um, used uh, a lot of artillery munitions. Um, and they uh, also used the most of uh, its guns, I mean uh, artillery guns, because they also ha have uh, their lifetime. So uh, each, uh, for instance, Hovitzer uh, can fire just uh, 2,000, maybe 3,000 uh, 
uh, at the remunition uh, before uh, being replaced. Three thousand is optimistic, but, I think. Uh, it's it's optimistic and conservative. Uh, be, uh, because uh, it depends on whether or not soldiers uh, use a special uh, chemistry um, th that prolong uh, the the lifetime of of gun. Uh, I, I presume they do not use this uh, special chemistry, so they just fire the munitions uh, without any um, caring about gun. Uh, but uh, at the end, okay, uh, Russia, uh, the Russian factories were able to uh, produce and modernize up to one million and seven hundred thousand uh, artillery munitions every year. And uh, they started to do this in 2010s. Before uh, 2010s, in uh, 1990s and early 2000s, uh, Russia did not produce a significant amounts of artillery munitions. So uh, Russia used the Soviet era munitions. But uh, after 30 years, the Soviet storages of artillery cannot be used in a proper way because artillery munitions uh, also has their lifetime, even if they are in storage. Uh, even I'll... if they are in... Yes. Yes, yes. Finish, finish. Uh, I will ask. Yeah, yeah. Um, even if uh, they, uh, they are in a good storage conditions, but the Russian artillery munition is not in a good storage condition because uh, Russian artillery arsenals, uh, uh, they are old-fashioned enough. So uh, 1 million and uh, 700,000 of artillery munitions every year. And uh, it, uh, I, I mean all types of artillery munitions from a small uh, munition to main calibers. Uh, so Russia used the most of them already. And uh, can, can, can this munition uh, will be, um, can this uh, munition be replaced? I'm not sure. Because currently Russia spent up to 10 years of its manufacturing. I mean, used munitions uh, on the battlefield. Uh, and uh, that's a problem because the Russian uh, gunpowder factories like Perm, like uh, Kazan, uh, and so on, uh, they are dependent on the imported industrial equipment. Austria. They cannot, yeah, they, they, can, they cannot use uh, Russian-made equipment because there is no Russian-made equipment at all. Uh, the same, uh, meanwhile, the same uh, towards the missiles because all the factories that produce uh, rocket fuel in Russia, especially uh, solid rocket fuel, they are dependent on, uh, on the imported uh, industrial equipment. Uh, imported from Europe, especially from Germany, imported from other countries like uh, the United States, like Japan, and so on. Uh, uh, so uh, Russia is not able to replace uh, the um, artillery munition, uh, munitions arsenal. Of course, uh, Russia still has some amount of this, uh, and in case of uh, lower intensity of conflict, uh, Russia will be able to use uh, artillery for a while. But also the problem is with uh, guns. Guns themselves, I mean, howitzers, uh, tank guns, uh, and so on and so on. Um, because 
uh, okay, you exhausted the lifetime of your guns, but who will replace them? The only factory in Russia uh, which is able to produce guns, I mean artillery guns, uh, is uh, Motovilha plant in Perm. And uh, Motovilha plant, firstly, uh, it feels very bad I mean, in economic terms. Uh, several years ago, uh, it moved through bankruptcy. And uh, the efficiency of this factory is very low. But also, this factory is completely dependent on the Austrian-made industrial equipment. Austrian-made, uh, Matavilliha ordered uh, the industrial equipment in Austria in 2011. And uh, next years uh, after 2011, Matavilliha got this industrial equipment. And uh, now it's impossible to replace or to modernize these uh, facilities. So uh, Russia will lose its artillery, its artillery as well. Of course, there are some amount of howitzers uh, and other types of artillery uh, in storage, manufactured in Soviet times, 1970s, 1980s, 1950s even. Uh, but we'll see whether or not uh, it's possible to use uh, Z guns and to replace um, the current artillery. So, uh, in every field of uh, arms, I mean, helicopters, planes, tanks, uh, artillery, missiles, we see the same picture. We see uh, that uh, Russia used uh, more than half, at least more than half of every uh, type of uh, arms. Sometimes it used the amount uh, that is equal of 10 years of manufacturing. Sometimes it used the amount that is equal of 12 years of manufacturing. But whether or not Russia has a next 10 or 12 years of, of manufacturing, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because uh, the, the current sanctions, it's embargo. De facto, it is embargo on, on supply of equipment, technologies, components, uh, components in Russia. So uh, the Russian industrial, um, the industrial base, the, the Russian defense industry just does not have another 10 years. It will die by 2030. It, 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 it will not completely die. It, it, it will survive in some, in some parts, but uh, it, it will not be uh, industry. It will not be industrial complex. It will be a kind of, you know, uh, some uh, uh, number of, uh, of factories uh, which will produce something that, will, that they will be able to produce. Pavel, and, uh, Russia, Russia will never be able to replace uh, uh, but its from, uh, military power. From the current war perspective, how long uh, Russia would able to maintain itself from the technological point of view? Because you outlined some some like a perspectives. Uh, even you said even till the end of the 2023, in some certain areas, Russia is able to maintain technologically itself. But uh, my, uh, my, my estimations, they are conservative enough. Uh, I, uh, I try not to overestimate. Okay, in current shape, uh, in current shape, how yeah. Russia is doing right in now? Uh, how long it it's can, can maintain itself? In current shape. Mm, in, in, in current shape, uh, I, I think that Okay, after 2023, it will be hard to maintain the manufac uh, manufacturing of uh, missiles. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about tanks. I presume that uh, battle tanks uh, Russia is not able to produce. Uh, Russia is able just to modernize uh, battle tanks. 
but uh, without imported components, uh, Russia is not able to modernize them as well. Or it will be just, you know, a modernization on paper. Um, we, we may already see the contract uh, for mo mo modernization of 800 T-62 battle tanks. Russia uh, replaced them uh, more than 10 years ago. And uh, Russia denied from them uh, more than 10 years ago, after, after the war in Georgia. It's a tank from, from 1950s. And uh, how to modernize these tanks? Okay, um, maybe it is possible to, 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 to provide some modernization of these tanks, but uh, the Russian industrial capacity uh, does not allow Russia to modernize them in a proper way. Yeah. Just, just factories are not able to do this. Uh, so, um, okay, uh, Russia will try to modernize something uh, in the next uh, one or two years. Uh, Russia will be able to produce uh, some artillery munitions uh, in the next, uh, I don't know, two or three years. Yes, but, uh, yes, but it, it depends on the level of intensity of, of conflict. If Russia will uh, will be able to decrease the level of intensity through ceasefire agreement or something like that, um, Russia will improve its statement. If uh, Ukraine, together with the West, will not give Russia this break, will not give Russia this time, and will continue its uh, combat pressure on Russia, Russia will collapse uh, in coming. Yes, but in coming let me let months. me ask because that's a, that, that's a great moment to 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 ask the the the, the subsequent question. If they have no prospects to to reach the uh, uh, numerical advantage in manpower, as uh, as we uh, as we described the, the the picture, if they have no prospect to reach the advantage in equipment, or even they will have tremendous problems with munition and um, every almost everything, on what they count on, I mean the Kremlin, because in this situation. The last tool uh, they can use is nuclear escalation. If we are, uh, if we want to 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 win the war or, or to win the peace, just mean to 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 stop the war on our on our conditions, because time is not working on the Russian side. Uh, yes, uh, the Kremlin. Uh... <laughs> the, the Kremlin believes in um, several things. The first uh, thing, uh, the Kremlin believes that uh, the West will not be able to support uh, Ukraine uh, for a long-term prospect. Uh, the second thing, the Kremlin believes that there will be a uh, kind of crisis, uh, social crisis, economic crisis, political crisis in Ukraine because of Kremlin's terror, because of uh, ongoing war. Kremlin believes that uh, Ukrainians are tired from, from the war and so on and so on. The third thing. Kremlin's, uh, the, the Kremlin believe, uh, believes that uh, there will be a new military crisis uh, in the world uh, in, in foreseeable future, maybe in 2023. Doesn't matter whether or not it will be Iran or it will be China with Taiwan or it, uh, it will be both or, or something like that. Uh, and uh, fourth thing, the Kremlin believes 
that it will be able to restore its military power. That it needs just a break, I don't know, one year, two years, three years, uh, that uh, the Kremlin will be able to mobilize the Russian economy, to uh, isolate uh, the Russian society from the world in a proper way, and uh, to restore the economy, because um, they, they don't know history. They uh, don't know that uh, the Soviet Union won the Second World War um, just because of land lease, just because of uh, in industrial supplies for, from the United States. They presume, uh, currently the Russian authorities uh, presume that uh, uh, everything is possible. That uh, with support of Iran, China, North Korea, Belarus, uh, with the motivation of, of, of the Russian uh, people, uh, the Kremlin will be able to restore its military power. But, uh, you know, it's a kind of uh, magical thinking. But uh, it's a part of, of the Kremlin's uh, rationality. Does it mean that you don't believe in the uh, nuclear escalation? Oh, of course, of course, uh, escalation, escalation is also an option. In case of um, the Kremlin will not be able to get a break, uh, get a break uh, within this war, uh, it, 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 it may use a nuclear weapon. And uh, currently, in my opinion, the current uh, probability of using nuclear weapon, weapon is higher than it was on spring. But at the same time, we should not overestimate, uh, we should no, uh, not overestimate the threat. Okay, even if Russia will use nuclear weapons, the world will, will survive. Ukraine will survive, the West will survive, NATO will survive, uh, but uh, Russia will lose um, I don't know, we lose all its rep uh, reputation. No one in this world will, will support Russia, but everyone in this, in this world will hate Russia and will do uh, anything uh, to stop Russia, even China, even, I don't know, North, North Korea possibly. Because um, uh, in, uh, there is no choice. Uh, the West uh, and Ukraine, of course, uh, Ukraine and uh, together with the West, uh, uh, they uh, can stop Russia only on the battlefield. It's, it's impossible to do this in other way, because if Russia uh, will get this break, uh, will get time to restore some power, uh, Russia also will spend this time, will use this time to destroy uh, the global order, Russia definitely will become a, a major proliferator of missile technologies, of nuclear technologies to Iran, to North Korea, to Turkey, for instance, why not? Because uh, Turkey, despite the fact that Turkey uh, is a NATO member, uh, despite the fact that uh, Turkey uh, su uh, supplies uh, Bayraktars to Ukraine, and so on. Uh, the specifics uh, of the Turkish uh, political regime right now may uh, give an unexpected uh, results, may, may give uh, unexpected outcomes. Uh, so uh, Russia may become a major proliferator of nuclear and missile technologies. So uh, how, how, how to avoid this? just to stop Russia on the battlefield. Because uh, in case of uh, major defeat in Ukraine, uh, Russia uh, will face a significant domestic political turbulence. And it, this political turbulence uh, may, uh, may uh, give a kind of, uh, you, you know, um, may give a reconciliation of, uh, of the conflict.
Pavel, we have to finish because some other Zooms are waiting for us. And Super. Again, thank you very much. And and I see I see real potential that we need to meet again. And uh, and if you would agree and with it with our <laughs> proposal, we would happy to speak once again with you regarding these topics. And again, thank you very much. No, dziękuję bardzo thank za zaproszenie you. i do zobaczenia w takim razie. <laughs> Dziękuję. Dziękuję.